Why is chanting so important? And why do so many people do not want to do it? <laughs> it's the constant, uh, I think, uh, pet peeve. A lot of people, when, especially when I uh, talk to people about doing chanting every day, uh, I always get uh, like a bit of a pushback and a uh, kind of, uh, let's say, uh, an apprehension to do chanting. Well, first of all, we have to understand what chanting is, right? <clears throat> Particularly in this tradition. Now, chanting is simply repeating Buddha's words. That's basically it. So that's what we're doing at the primary level, right? At the basic level, where you're just repeating Buddha's words. Now, this in itself is massive. It's quite huge because... Buddha's words are the language of wisdom. It's the language of wisdom. Everything the Buddha says has purpose, right? Everything the Buddha says has, is a medicine. Everything the Buddha says always leads to a better, a better tomorrow or just betterness in general. There's a lot of goodwill in Buddha's words. There's a lot of compassion in, good, in, in Buddha's words, right? It's a lot of joy, a lot of joy in Buddha's words, right? And there's also a lot of equanimity. Plus, there's also the ingredient which takes you to the spice of freedom, the spice of uh, cessation of dukkha, right? Nirodo. Right? Nirodo. Right? Now, that's the primary, that's just at the primary level, like the basics, right? So the language of wisdom, you know, this normal speak that we speak, we speak normally about what worldly mundane things all the time like how was your day the weather's nice um i'll eat i'll have some fries with that yeah what what kind of uh bill am i going to pay the conversations you know what what how what color we're going to paint that wall now i'm not mocking or trying to be condescending to normal everyday uh let's say parlance but at the same time the buddha's words uh are profoundly wise and uh, I guess uh, beneficial, beneficial in so many ways. It's no I, not idle chatter. It's also like uh, there's a lot of protection. There's a lot of protection that uh, you can gain from Buddha's words. That's it. now that's the first, like the first primary level, right? Where you you're just chanting, repeating the words. And the second thing is reflection. Now, in the West, uh, particularly amongst uh, the kind of, uh, I guess, in the Buddhist world, a lot of emphasis is placed on meditation, um, vipassana workshops, um, and just sitting and not doing much else. Chanting is always casted to the side, usually. usually it's, it's, I say always, but yeah, it's pretty much, pretty much always, but it's definitely not ingrained, right? So when you become a monk, or if you want to be a monk, chanting is definitely something that you have to get used to because we do lots of it, right? But as a lay person, I would say it's even more important because it takes you away from the, the daily, the daily uh, conversation, right? And it reminds you, it keeps you in line with Buddha's wisdom. That's the other reason why we chant is to, is to keep us in line, to remind us to reflect on Buddha's words. Uh, on the truth of Buddha's words, on the Dharma, that keeps us, uh, I guess, refreshed. Um, it keeps us, I, it, it fills us up with joy because Buddha's words always lead to joy, really, it, uh, because freedom is full of joy, right? So chanting, uh, recitation, uh, you know, so there's two levels so far. There's the primary level and there's the reflection level, when one reflects on the Buddha's words. Now, when one, med when one meditates frequently, uh, remember the first five arahants, the first five disciples of the Buddha, they had to hear Dharma, right? They had to hear the Dharma. Their meditation was pretty good because it was only after the, the second discourse, right? The Anatta uh, discourse that the five uh, first disciples were able to awaken completely after two discourses. So their practice must have been at a certain astute, a level of astuteness or you know, a certain high level. But more importantly, what we have to understand is they heard the Dharma. So that's the third reason why we chant, because it, uh, it definitely is a, 
is a is a side by side, um, uh, I guess, uh, ingredient to 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 concentration practice, and to and to sati as well, the practice of sati, because when we're chanting, we're hearing the words, we're hearing Buddha's words, we're hearing them, we're reflecting on them, we're repeating them, so they go right down into the mind, right? So we we absorb ourselves, we actually. Um, I guess attune ourselves to this kind of language, the language of wisdom, right? So it's not just it's not just um, what I guess coming from a, a Christian background myself. I guess I guess you know prayer is always uh, maybe associated with asking for things or praying to an entity um, out there, but Buddha's words are not. Uh, are not in that direction. The direction's inward. It's to focus on the truth, to focus on Dharma, right? So it's 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 not like we're asking for help. It's just what we're doing is we're taking refuge in the Buddha and the Dharma. The Buddha and the Dharma in this case, right? Because we're repeating the Buddha's words and we're and we're repeating the Dharma as well, right? So that's part of the three refuges, right? So this is really important when we're practicing to understand that chanting is an integral part of practice. It's not, uh, it's not to be cast into the side or be taken lightly. Uh, the words, so many people heard Buddha's, Buddha's words <clears throat> when Buddha spoke to them and were able, were able to awaken. And that's what we need to always consider. I mean, the Buddha is not here in the flesh, but the teaching is still here. That's why we, uh, the fourth reason is to preserve the teaching for others. Uh, the more we chant, the more when others come to, to listen, they can listen to the Buddha's words and they can develop the memory. They can memorize the Buddha's words as well. So it's also to preserve for future generations as well. So that's the other reason why we're chanting, for selfless reasons, not just for our own benefit, not for our own joy, not just for our own growth, but also to preserve the teaching <clears throat> to look after the teaching, to guard the teaching, um, and give others the opportunity to come and listen one day as well in the future. And that's why it's important to develop a strong uh, chanting practice, I believe. Instead of reading, chanting is different to reading. I mean, you're still reading, but when you're chanting and you're, and you're concentrating on the words, it's, it's a little bit different from reading. Just try the two and you'll see the difference. It's, it's quite different. Um, to reading a sutta and chanting a sutta, right? It's it's it, they're, they're two different things. When you when you commit it to memory, for example, the Dhamma Chakka Sutta discourse, which we chant a lot, <clears throat> it's very different to reading it than to chanting it. It's a whole different level. It's a whole different experience. So uh, I urge you to keep to keep chanting, but also I urge you to. How can I say, you know, consider this, consider this, right? Consider the most important thing is that one has to hear Dharma. Well, not has to, but most, but most Arahants at the time heard Dharma, right? In some cases, uh, not so, like an, like Venerable Ananda who lied down, he had to lie down and, and then he awoke and it wasn't after hearing the Buddha's words. But, you know, I guess there's some cases like that, but in general, he, will, he listened to the Buddha for a long time, so it always helps. But remember, if you're not interested in chanting for yourself, remember that by, by memorizing and chanting, you're preserving the teaching as well. And I think as Buddhists, that's our duty, as, as part of our duty as well. So, hope you agree.